<clears throat> well, I think with that, I think we are now uh, technically live. So thank you to everyone that's uh, joined us tonight to watch this on YouTube. We're joined by the Letting Orion board and, uh, and new investors. Um, who'll be answering some of the questions you sent in to us <clears throat> during this week. Um, well, I think with that, I think we are now to, uh, uh, technically uh, live. So thank you to everyone that's my voice coming back through. Uh, but now we'll hand over to, to Nigel for, for an introduction and uh, to get us underway. Luke, thank you very much and welcome everyone. I'm going to be doing this in uh, three parts tonight. I'm going to be uh, firstly making a few prepared remarks. Um, I'm also then going to introduce uh, existing board members, new board members, and new investors. We're a couple missing, but uh, you'll, you'll see just about everyone. And then we're going to take your questions and answers. And I think the whole thing is aimed to take an hour. And I thank everyone for joining us on what is a joint US and UK bank holiday weekend. We have Memorial Day over here on Monday. So I want to start by saying I'm very happy that I've been a Lake Orient fan. For 61 years. I've uh, gone through lots of ups and downs, uh, as we have all. Uh, but to be clear, because I get asked this a lot, I never expected or aimed to be an owner of the club. But as I have been for four years with some great people, uh, I want to say I'm very happy doing it. So as I said, you know, we've seen many ups and downs through the years. And when we had the opportunity four years ago to buy the club. We did so not only out of necessity, but also because we wanted the club to continue well into the future. We see it as a community asset. It's very important that Leitner, in my view, is around in a hundred years when obviously none of us will probably be around unless they're newborns. So when we came in back in June, 2017, as many people have heard many times, but perhaps some haven't, we had nothing. We had no training ground, no players, no coaching staff, no credit card processing, and even no bank account. So we've worked very steadily over the last four years to put the club back into good shape. It's been hard work, but enjoyable work. But over that time, we've spent a lot of money, and that obviously wasn't helped by the pandemic in the last year or so and the overall structure of football finance. So let me be clear, and this is the first major point. The structure of football does need changing, and I'm confident that the recent events involving the Super League, which has stimulated the government's involvement, as well as the impact of the pandemic, will lead to change in the near future. I believe that change will be very positive for clubs in the EFL. In our view, and people may have different views, in our view, the EFL is very well led by Rick Parry and Trevor Birch. And just for those who don't know, Trevor actually worked for Leighton Orient for a short time when we bought the club. He was then our financial advisor. He's now the CEO of the EFL. We came in, we had a plan. It's the so-called six-year plan, which essentially was to get Orient back to its rightful place in League One. Every year we've made progress, despite the difficulties of losing our beloved head coach, Justin Edinburgh, coronavirus. Uh, virus. Uh, and I recognize that some people will debate the progress we made in the season just finished, but I deem last year a relative success as we dealt with the pandemic and, prog and made progress in our league position over the previous season. Yes. I did say that when we appointed Joby, we gave ourselves the opportunity to get into the playoffs, but unfortunately, we did not take that opportunity. Our aim is to take it at the uh, shortest opportunity we can. Now, while all that's been going on, while we've been handling coronavirus, and that's really been a daily job for Martin and Danny, I've met a lot of people who are interested in investing in English football. And we decided as a board last year to bring all this together to do an offering, which is really a fancy term as it put, brings together in an organized way, a way of bringing financing to the club. To do this, we supported it with a five-year financial plan and a set of capital expenditure expectations 
so that the club could be funded over the next several years. The process preparing for the offering was long, interesting, made us think about a lot of options, and we learned many things as we went through that journey. And as we went through the process of pulling that presentation together, which we called the investor presentation, we set out six goals. Number one was to get into League One as soon as possible and recognize in our league, four clubs still go up every year. So we'll try and take advantage of that as soon as we can. Secondly, and this is very important for the future, take the academy to the next level. And you'll be interested to know in our financial plan, we did not put in any money for profit on any players we may sell out of the academy. Obviously, a lot of clubs at our level have made a lot of money over time. Clubs like Exeter and Crew are good examples. That is not in our plan. So if you like, that is a benefit we could have. The third thing is reduced costs based on the EFL cost control mechanisms. Last year, we had the salary cap. For legal reasons, that was scrapped, and the league continues to look at ways of controlling costs better. The next one, which I see everyone's jumping on the bandwagon now, is something that Danny has led over the last couple of years, is boosting our non-match day revenue, or as it's called in the financial world, sweating our underutilized assets. Most clubs operate in the stadium 25, 30 days a year. We have to find a way of operating and using our facilities over 300 days a year, and Danny has a plan for that. The next thing is to drive our streaming and other revenue globally through database marketing and investigating new areas such as esports. So far, we've been very successful at that, and you'll be pleased to know that the streaming that you all supported so strongly last year was a profitable area for us during the season. Thank you for your support. And the sixth point was to develop strong partnerships. Uh, a good example is Hartford Athletic. I'm actually going to see them play tomorrow night. And I want to thank a few Leighton Orient fans who we picked up in the Hartford area as a result of that partnership. Other examples are women's football. And Martin is well on the way to establishing a new way forward for women's football in E10. Our overseas camps, and this year we're doing camps assuming we can travel from uh, London, uh, camps in Denmark, uh, and over here we've got three camps lined up in various parts of the Northeast. We've also been contacted by many other clubs around the US to do more camps. We had a lot of interest in investing in, in the club, and as part of that, we had several investors who wanted to take control of the club. You may ask why we didn't take them up on the offer. We felt that the right thing for Leighton Orient was continuity and the work that we'd started, we wanted to complete. So the journey will continue. Hence, we went out with a formal offering, a presentation, and that everything that anyone would do if they're trying to raise money. We had many people who commented on our professionalism. And it's interesting, this point came out very strongly when Martin led our recent search for a manager. We had several candidates who were rejected who commented that our professionalism in the approach was far beyond what they would have expected for a League Two team. We now have built a club, and I'm very proud of this, that is regarded in the game as extremely professional and well organized. And the purpose of tonight is to introduce you to our new board members and our leading investors. Before I do that, I want to comment on where we now stand as a club. So this is like a snapshot in time. We are ambitious, but we're going to be very sensible and, and ensure we are prudent about how we spend the new investment money we have. We're very excited about next season under Kenny's leadership on the field. We're optimistic that you'll be back at the Breyer Group Stadium next season. And once again, we've certainly missed you all. And it really does make a difference to the players when you're there. We're bullish about what we're doing off the field under Danny's leadership. And we're going to be sensible and balanced in our approach. As I said before, we're going to spend the investment money very sensibly. A few years ago, before our time, 
we saw the results of rash and fast spending. So why do this? Well, we have always tried to run the club in the four years in a very open and transparent way. And given recent events in football, I wanted you to have the opportunity to put a face to a name. We don't want our investors to be faceless individuals you've never met. We want them to feel part of the Lake Orient family. And, and to do that, we think the best way is to encourage you to ask as many questions as you can. We've had many that have already been sent in, but I'd encourage you to submit some other questions. And if you don't know how to do it, Luke will tell you shortly. So in terms of introductions, I'm gonna start with existing board members. And the first one, of course, I want to introduce is Ken. And before I do, I want to say, no one could have been a better partner uh, than Kent in the last four years. His advice on so many occasions has been invaluable. His initiatives have gone through everything we've done at the club. And I know some of you have wondered where he's been. Kent really does uh, live when he's at the stadium. So Kent, live to the people of Leighton. Hello all. Uh, great to get the chance to speak to you. Uh, I'm Kent Teague. I'm the uh, vice chairman at Leighton Orient Football Club. And we're very excited about the future of Leighton Orient, uh, just like we were four years ago. So uh, best to you all. My primary role in life has been to uh, take care of my family and uh, do what I needed to do in order to uh, deal with the pandemic. And so I've been very quiet, but uh, hopefully uh, as soon as is possible, I'll be back in the United Kingdom and I can't wait for all of us to get together and do what we normally do when we're at a Leighton Orient Football Club match. So all the best. Ken, thanks. And uh, again, I appreciate everything you've done over the last four years. So the next two can't be with us tonight. That's Matt Porter, who I think most people know very well. And Matt's done a wonderful job when Kent and I couldn't travel over there. Uh, so appreciate his full support. Marshall Taylor, who of course was the CEO of the club for a short time before Danny, uh, he couldn't join us today, but um, Marshall again is still actively involved. And then uh, my own son, David, most of you may not know, but David has got a career, career in broadcasting and it's his initiative that we have such a good streaming service and the pre-game, half-time and post-game show. So David, a few words, please. Yeah, hi all, um, Dave Travis. Good to see you all again. Um, I've, I've been involved since the very early days of the, the first negotiations with um, the previous. And uh, I remember when we had only nine players and uh, there was a lot of energy and uh, no credit score, et cetera. So it's been an interesting journey, but I think the new journey, the real journey is ahead of us now. And uh, so super excited to have uh, this wonderful group of people that have joined the club and uh, I'm very positive about where we're going and I'm looking forward to being back at the stadium and as Kent says, doing what we do best. David, thank you and let's hope the streaming goes to even higher levels in the future. And then uh, Rich Emmett, who I sometimes put down as the most popular board member, Rich claimed he knew nothing about football or soccer as they say in America when he joined the club, he now knows a bit about soccer. So, Rich. Yes, uh, and that's much to Martin's dismay because I, 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 I offer him my opinions now, which uh, he's been gracious to accept, but not, not uh, uh, slap me down yet, but I'm sure that's to come. So, uh, welcome everyone. I am uh, really excited about the progress that we've made over the past four years and uh, particularly welcome to uh, certainly the supporters that are on the video and, and also to our new investors. And I only see more good things to come in the future. So I echo what Kent said and what David said. I cannot wait for the restrictions to be lifted so we can be back at Brisbane, Brisbane and, uh, and see the progress in, in real time. So you're calling in today from Denver, right? Uh, actually, I'm on St. John. St. John. Okay. So in the Virgin Islands, right. Um, okay, so next thing is our new directors. So our board has gone up from six to eight. And uh, Coley will say where he lives because I'm somewhat confused at times. But 
Uh, firstly, Cody Perry. Hi, everyone. Coley Perry. Um, I grew up in Chicago, Illinois. I've spent most of my adult life in New York City. Um, I now travel a lot, around a lot, but I call London home. Um, happy to be a resident of London. I am an investor by profession, but a massive sports fan personally. Um, I'm extremely excited about joining the Laden Orient community. And one thing that I want everyone to know is how much I appreciate how welcoming the Orient community has been since we announced the new investment. And I hope that me and my team can do right by your club. So up the O's. Cody, thank you. And, and Cody's uh, partner uh, actually played in the internal Laden Orient game this week and scored a goal. So, we already have a striker we're looking at. So, um, <laughs> he's <okay>. pricey. <laughs> oh, he's pricey, is he? Yes. <laughs> right. And then secondly, uh, someone who knows football quite well, but also knows other sports because he owns a team, Nick Samarka. Uh Hi, everybody. And uh, I am very glad to uh, be a part of this team. And I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing uh, the fans uh, next time. Uh, Mr. Johnson lets us uh, into the country. I, uh, I am professionally retired, which is uh, one of my uh, greatest achievements in life. Uh, I split my time living in Miami and Chicago. I've been a football fan for a long time. I am the son of European immigrants. And so uh, I've been to, I, I love football. I played football. Uh, grew up in the days of Pele and Beckenbauer with the New York Cosmos. Um, as Nigel uh, mentioned, uh, post-retirement, I actually bought a baseball team in the United States, and it's my first investment in sports. And now I've spent the last two years uh, looking to invest in football, uh, try to leverage some of the things I learned and also you know, get a little closer to the game I love. And so uh, that led to uh, joining the team here, and I'm just super excited to be part of it. So, so, Nick, one of the benefits of having Nick is uh, as an ex-professional consultant, he asks great questions, and we appreciate all those questions. Um, I'm going to remind you that you said that someday, Nigel. Yeah, and I know. That's, that, 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 <laughs> I, as I said it, I feared that. But anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then we had some other investors uh, who invested into the club, one I've got down as a new investor. He's not on the call today, but he actually invested uh, last year and came to the game before we were shut down at Stevenage. So Joe's had a wonderful experience, Joe Cagini. He, he saw us win 3 nothing at Stevenage before the lockdown, not this season, previous season. Uh, Joe, I've known for a long time. He, he has franchise stores with Wendy's and Taco Bell. Uh, and Joe used to play football at a very high level in college, and I get a detailed analysis about every game, every every time we play. So, you know, you'll get to know Joe. is a great guy. Um, the next one is Kevin, continuing the Chicago connection. So, Kevin, over to you. Thanks, Nigel. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Willer. Um, I'm in Chicago, uh, as mentioned, but I did. I lived in London a couple of times in my life and uh, gained a great passion for the sport there. Um, in fact, was there in 2019 and uh, Danny Macklin showed me around the grounds and uh, I didn't get to see a match that day because uh, the club was out of town. But uh, so I got to visit there and got to know Nigel and everybody over the last couple of years and I'm thrilled to be uh, an investor in the club thrilled to see what we can do here and, and help take it to the next level. Uh, my background is venture capital and technology. I worked for Google for a long time. So hopefully I can bring some of that technology expertise to the table here. And, uh, and I'm just thrilled to be a part of this. So uh, up the O's, got my mug here, uh, if you can see it. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting over there for a match here this year sometime. So thanks for having me. Kevin, thank you. And Ke Kevin has already started to help us think about partnerships and marketing and someone else who's done that is not on the call today because he's doing the pitch because he's a marketing person he's uh, doing an advertising pitch to a company is james fenton and uh for the last year we've used one of the agencies that he's he oversees he's he's part of a company called omnicom 
and he has several agencies that report into him. And we've used some of their capabilities to analyze our social media, where our fans are, how to connect with our fans, what our fans are saying, uh, potential new fans, etc. It's been very helpful. Um, but James Fenton, he's based in New York and Fort Lauderdale. Uh, he's been to a game with me. Uh, it was the last home game before we got shut down last year. I've forgotten who we played, actually. But anyway, he came the week after Joe Cagini came. So he's been there. Uh, his son also plays football at quite a high level. So, again, a great football background. And then uh, the next one is uh, Jason, Jason Bain. Uh, Jason, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Again, Chicago-based. Yeah, uh, Chicago-based, actually a high school friend of Kevin's and a friend of Jeff's, who I think you'll probably hear from next. Um, and it was through the two of these guys that I was made aware of this investment. And without hearing many of the details, I was all in, uh, particularly having met uh, Nigel briefly professionally and, and having known of his you know, very strong reputation professionally. Um, but most importantly, the attraction to me was uh, not just the love of the game, but uh, I also uh, spent a good portion of my youth in, living in London and uh, really was an admirer, not just of the game, but of the culture of English football, which to me is the greatest of all sports leagues in you know, in the world. And I think notwithstanding some of what you read about, you know, greedy American investors wanting to get in and muck up the game, what I suspect you'll find from all the folks on this call is, is a desire to first do no harm um, and then put a better product out there uh, because it's really, you know, it doesn't need much improvement. So thrilled to be involved. And, um, you know, I, the other thing that really appealed to me was hearing Kent talk about the culture of the club as something akin to a clan or a family. And it's interesting. Um, normally I try to not read um, comments on Twitter and social media because they tend to be so toxic, but I was really impressed um, at the comments around some of the recent announcements and, and the, the warm welcome that we got from fans and, and the positive attitude for the future was very encouraging. So hopefully uh, we can contribute to that in a small way. Jason, uh, thank you. And then last but not least, Jeff, uh, who again came via Kevin. But uh, Jeff, tell us a bit about your background, please. Yeah, thanks, Nigel. Again, Chicago. Uh, and my love of football uh, really began through um, what I do, which is uh, work in commercial insurance brokerage. And visiting London many times throughout each of the last 25 years, I've come to uh, just love uh, English football. And when this opportunity was brought up um, by Kevin and I got to know Nigel about a year ago and, and we had uh, a, a number of conversations with each one, I became more and more encouraged about it and uh, excited about the opportunity. So uh, great to be along for the ride and looking forward to it. Jeff and everyone, uh, thank you very much. I think one thing that got missed is, as football changes, Kevin, why don't you just tell us a bit about your investment in women's football? Th thank you, Nigel. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that um, I recently invested in a club here in the U.S. in the National Women's Soccer League uh, called the Chicago Red Stars. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in the U.S. and obviously the men's side of the sport, but more recently in, um, in promoting the women's side of the, uh, of the sport, um, there's been a lot of new investments. There's some new clubs being started in LA and other places. So um, it's been really exciting to be a part of that. Uh, we just started our season. I got our first win on Wednesday night. So uh, hopefully we'll have a really good season. There's only 10 clubs in the league, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's really uh, growing up a lot. So hopefully I can take some of those learnings and apply them to some of the, the work here at, at Orient. Thanks, Nigel. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, before we start the q and I just want to say to everyone who's either watching live or watching the recording, we see this as a partnership, uh, and we'd encourage you, obviously, to sign up for season cards. Um, and obviously, non-match day, which is things like weddings, meetings. Uh, if, you can't, if you're outside the area streaming, 
which, as I said, was very successful. And, of course, buying merchandise from the club shop. Um, I think if we continue to work the way we've worked over the last four years as a total partnership, we will be as successful as possible. So with that, I'm going to pass back to Luke, uh, who's going to take in all the Q, all the questions, and, and we'll go through and try and answer as many as we can. Luke. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, Nigel, and thank you everyone to, uh, for your introductions. We've had um, a, a few questions sent by email during the week, so we're going to start by by going through those and um, everyone can answer them as, as they best see fit. But if you are watching live and, and you do have any questions um, on YouTube, just, just drop a few in the comments box and we'll, we'll try our best to try and get around to them as well. So um, to, kick, uh, to kick things off, we've got a, a question from Graham. Um, his question was, was one that was asked by quite a lot of people, actually. Um, so if I've not picked you in particular here, it's because this is um, one that's been repeated quite a lot. And, and that question is, what attracted the new investors to Leighton Orient? Bearing in mind that nobody gets rich running a football team. <laughs> uh, I'll kick off by saying that one of the things, because I've reinvested myself, uh, is uh, obviously for the love of the sport, for the community, asset that Leighton Orient is, but also I truly believe we can get to sustainability if, if the uh, body that's now studying football under Tracy Crouch does its work appropriately uh, and we're going to be through the EFL trying to influence that outcome. But you've heard that from me many times. We've talked with fans before about sustainability and how it works and the fact that most clubs lose a lot of money. I'll be interested in some other people uh, talking. Nick, would you like to have a go at that one? Yeah, well, um, so first off, I think one of the things, you know, back to, to Luke's question, and then I'll touch on your sustainability thing. Um, first of all, I just, the fans are a reason for me for investing in Orient. And what a lot of, a lot of people talk about Americans and what the hell are they doing coming over to England? And you got to, and I think for our, for the fans in the UK, you got to understand that uh, you got a, a lot of old school Americans on this, on this video, right? The old school guys who remember the days where the fans were a lot more passionate, uh, a lot more excited. And we miss that. I miss that personally. And when, when I've been uh, to the Brayer Group Stadium or Brisbane Road uh, before it even got named, I just get blown away by the excitement. And I love that. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, I miss that. We used to have a, an arena here called the Chicago stadium, which was probably one of the most passionate it was an indoor arena for the, for the bulls and the Blackhawks, one of the most passionate buildings ever created by man. And we don't do that anymore because uh, we build these big fancy arenas where you get to sit a hundred miles away from the ice or the pitch. I miss all that. So the fans and the environment excites me. Um, you know, I lived for two years in London. I know the culture as uh, Jason touched on it. I know the passion and, and it just makes sense. I looked at clubs in Denmark and Germany and Belgium everywhere, even in Lancashire. Uh, and it just felt a little bit like coming home to do something in London. And, and I've got respect, a ton of respect for the people on this call and the people on the board and the people on the management team for all the great things they've done. Now, I do think Nigel's point about creating sustainability is an important one. And, I, and, and, and I'm here because I think, I think there are different ways to approach uh, this issue. We need to be successful on the pitch. We need to aspire to ascend the pyramid. Uh, but I look at, you know, I look at clubs like Barnsley and Brentford doing things differently, looking at ways to, you know, ascend the pyramid without hemorrhaging cash to death. And I think this management team is excited about taking on that challenge. And I'm just happy to be part of it. So Nick, is part of that is doing things differently. And I think it's perhaps just worth going off the script, so to speak. And many people probably don't know that the, the major part of the work done at Barnsley and Brentford is using analytics. And I know some people are probably gonna be skeptical about this, 
but we've been moving down that route for some time. Martin, do you just want to talk about how many people you have looking at footballers through the eyes of analytics? Yeah, I mean, we've got uh, three full-time analysts now. Uh, two of them will look at performance uh, of the games week in, week out. So building a game plan to win, to help the manager win the games. And then we've also got a recruitment analyst for the first time that's just come in, uh, that's going, you know, he's working within uh, the knowledge that we've got in the, in the room anyway. So if you, you know, obviously you've got Kenny's knowledge now, uh, the management team that Kenny brings in, obviously my own knowledge in terms of uh, players. There's, there's, I, my belief is, look, look, I believe that the way forward for all of this is that if we mix both components, we'll have a great product. That's that's the way I look at it. I mean, people, some people look at it and, and, and think, well, analytics is coming away from what I know and it makes me feel uncomfortable that nothing could be further from the truth. And, and one of the main reasons, or certainly helps, obviously with Dean Smith, being a good power mine, he, he was at Brentford, as everybody knows, and, and, and they used the model there. And I see it worked at close hand because I was often over there when I was between jobs. So, look, I know it can work. You're never going to have a, you're never going to be able to win a game totally on analytics. You're never going to be totally, you're never going to be able to win a game totally without analytics. It's about putting them both together and the product uh, that comes out is exciting uh, and it helps everybody in that department. So we're as far advanced as when Kenny come here and I explained to him uh, that we got three analysts already, he said that that's one more than Portsmouth's got. So that probably tells people where we are as a League Two club. I don't think anyone will be as advanced as we are in League Two, personally. OK, thanks a lot, Martin. Luke? Um, yeah, I want... I wondered if anyone, any of the other new investors wanted to touch on that question as well about uh, what attracted them to Leighton Orient. I'm happy to. Um, you know, again, just to sort of touch on, on the culture experience. I mean, I think a good board needs the right combination of practicality and, and dreamers. And I think my involvement is more on the dreamer side. Um, I, you know, what, pro, other than the Chicago Cubs winning the World Series in 2016, the most memorable sporting event of my life was in 1982, being at the QPR game where they were promoted uh, to the first division. And I love the, it's one thing to get excited about Manchester City playing Liverpool, uh, but I, what I love about the culture is the, the Leicester story or the, the QPR promotion and the ability to help uh, a team move up the tables and, uh, you know, search for the unrealistic dream. But uh, but I think that the David and Goliath opportunity of supporting this great club with, that has a lot of great attributes uh, with some really optimistic long-term goals is, was my attraction. Anyone else? I'm happy to touch on it, on it briefly. I think uh, Nick and Kevin said a lot of the same things that I would say. But when we decided to do this um, we're at, at the Common Group um, maybe eight months ago, um, we set out to find um, the right club in which to invest. And uh, we looked up and down League One and Two. We even touched some teams in the championship. We even touched some teams in, in the EU. Um, and what we found were all of the elements that you would want in an investment with Leighton Orient. And, and what those things are, are really the people on two sides. Number one, we didn't come across a, a management group like this one. You don't have a management group like this one in League Two. Uh, you don't have it in League One. League one. It, across the EFL, I would tell you that these are the most professional people um, that we've met. And from uh, what Kent and Nigel have done since the previous owner, who shall not be named, uh, is is heroic. And uh, you guys should be really, really uh, glad that they are on your side. Um, so that was number one. Number two um, is the fan base. When I watched the YouTube videos of people storming the pitch um, with, you know, around the previous owner, I said, that is a community that I want to join. I want to be part of a group that is that passionate about their team. I want to be, I want to join that. And that is the group that is way beneath where they should be. Your rightful place is anywhere you want to be on the football pyramid. Yes, it takes money. 
Yes, it takes many other things, but the elements are all here. You have just as much right. You have a contract that that puts you anywhere in, in the in the football pyramid. So what we're trying to do is we are trying to uh, engineer some wins in the pitch, get promoted, um, add tools, data analytics is one of those tools that, we, that can help Martin. Um, of course, we don't have robots in the back room that is uh, making all the decisions for us. What, what really it is, is a way to help the win engineers on, on Martin's team engineer those. It's a new, it's another tool. Um, and, and the most important thing you know, is the human element of those, those of data analytics. The human element being is, are you curious enough to challenge your assumptions of what you think when you see things on the pitch? Um, number one, and then Number two, are you willing to change your mind and change your strategy based on some new stuff that you've learned from those data analytics? So it's really the human elements that are making the decisions there. Um, and that's why we're just trying to support Martin and his crew as, as mu- and Kenny as much as we can. So um, it, again, people, everything is about people. And Leighton Orient has all of the elements that are needed to, to be wherever they want to be. Luke? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, on the back of that question then, um, Barry had asked, uh, as the more successful the team becomes, the more money they will need. Um, are you able to put more money in or get other investors where each time investments will be diluted? Uh, okay, so I think that's a good question. And I think it goes back to what I said before about not spending all the money too quickly. Uh, raising money is painful. Uh, and anyone who's ever done it for any business, no matter how large or small, will know it's painful. But I think what we now have is a board that's going to think forward for a number of years. And we've tried to raise money for a number of years so that we can look at how we develop the club over that time. And I'll give you some things that we need to think about. We need to think about the pitch. You know, we've talked about a hybrid pitch. We need to think how we do that, how we fund it. Uh, We made a decision before we completed the financing, which was the East Stand. And as of my meeting with Danny this morning, we're seeing good progress there. And I know some people have even commented on things like the Fans Forum. It seems like a new uh, stand over there. We need to think about the training facilities we have. I mean, we basically have two training grounds and the one that's focused on the academy is nowhere near good enough. And that's why you lose players at 14, 15. How do you fund it? How do you support it? Do we move? Do we put all the training grounds together? Marshall Taylor, who's not on the call today, is actually leading the group looking at that. So we're trying to look down the road. We've raised the money. We're going to move forward with this money. But at the same time, we need to be totally focused on trying to raise more revenue because that will allow us to do more things as we go forward. So um, I'm hoping we don't have to go back and think about dilution or anything like that for many years. And uh, I welcome anyone else adding to that answer. Okay, look. Nigel, this is Rick. Um, I, I, I'll throw in one comment on the dilution uh, part of Andy's question. With regard to the addition of present ownership, I think it is the unanimous consensus of the earlier investors that we would much, much rather have a smaller slice of a larger pie that allows us to do more than to have a larger slice of a smaller pie, which limits our ability to get things done. I think uh, I just just to chime in, I, I go back to this notion of changing the paradigm. Uh, you know, I don't have the data, uh, but you know, Barnsley reportedly has a you know one of the lowest payrolls in the championship. They came within two matches of getting to the Premier League. Uh, Morkum is another club in our in our league that is ninety minutes away from getting promoted with uh, a pretty efficient payroll. I don't, I'm not going to pretend that uh, we've got magic answers, but I think that this is the kind of group that's going to figure out how we avoid 
uh, the constant need to just pour money into a club while being successful. Deny the notion that you know there has to be this trade-off and find the ways that other clubs are already finding to make this thing work. Okay, Luke. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Moving on to our third question, I believe it is, which is from John. Um, and John said, first of all, a massive thank you to Nigel and the board for making this last week one of the most exciting for us fans. We are now about to enter the fifth year of the board's six-year plan. Do you, have, do you have a new plan ready in place for the next five years? And if so, can you share any of the plan with and where with with us? Sorry, and where do you see the club in five years' time? Okay, so um, I saw that question before I wrote my remarks, so that's why I put the goals down earlier that I went through. So, uh, uh, so thank you very much for sending that in, John. Um, but in five years' time, and I think Danny has talked about this before, you know, we clearly expect to be more than League Two. Um, and, you know, ideally better than League One. Uh, we clearly are like an attendance of about 7,000 uh, fans in the stadium. And remember, we have some good opportunities. Coley talked about, you know, data mining. That's not just on players or managers or how we play. That is also using all the information that we have uh, in terms of ticketing and, and to, to grow the number of fans who come to the club. I also believe, and I don't want to upset our friends at places like West Ham, Arsenal, Tottenham, you're going to see a trade down. A lot of people are going to say, as a result of the Super League, we want to come and see real football in the capital. Oh, that happens to be what Leighton Orient is about. Um, so I'm hoping we pick up a lot of people like that. And the last opportunity, I think, is with 750 homes being built across the road from the West Stand and another 750 going behind that. That's 1,500 homes that we should be able to target to bring people into the stadium. So I think we've got to do a better job getting people from Waltham Forest into the ground. Um, Danny's got some amazing number that, Something like 90% of people, I think it is, Danny, in Waltham Forest have never been in the stadium. I mean, we got to find ways to get them to come in and then say, wow, this is a pretty cool place, uh, which, by the way, I think it is. I think it's a great stadium. And we get them in, and then hopefully they'll come and see a game or two. Danny, anything to say on that? Yeah, the pandemic obviously didn't come at a great time. We we just turned on that button in about February 2019. Uh, that button is ready to turn on uh, again uh, when we when we can, basically, when we can have fans back in the Brown Group Stadium in addition to season card holders. There is a lot of opportunities. There's some low-hanging fruit. It staggers me, that stat that we worked out, that 90% is obviously, there is a little bit of science behind that. We've got to get that down to the same beginning with an 80 and then down to the same beginning with a 70. We all play a part in that in spreading the word. So we're, you know, we've obviously got a lot of fans living outside of the borough. Uh, they can spread the word, but we want to spread the word right across and that doesn't just include attendance at the stadium on match day this is non-match day as well as people streaming our games worldwide Ken anything to say on that you've lived the journey um, there there is tremendous opportunity in where we exist in London um, there is a lot of opportunity up and down the central line. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity in the catchment area that we find ourselves in. And kind of going back to, you know, sustainability and balance and all of that. Those are things that we will always grapple with. Uh, what are the right investments to make? How do we make those investments? you know, short-term players, long-term players, all, all of that. Um, but hopefully we'll continue to learn, make better decisions and uh, continue to improve. Um, the last point, as far as goals, the first five-year plan uh, was, or there was really four to eight, was to get us out of the National League. That was the first objective. You know, we accomplished that. Uh, and then it was to get us from League Two into League One. And we believe that that will happen over the next 
couple of years, probably. And so then it becomes a conversation of uh, pushing up and in, into the championship. So we'll see how that goes. But that's that's the next the next the the next five year plan is really for us to improve as much as we have in the last four years. And we wanted to create for ourselves a runway. Uh, and that's why we, uh, you know, are blessed to have been able to bring in all of these fantastic additional investors because they are providing us with that financial runway and their contributions on the board and, and as uh, investors that will allow us to improve the club as much in the next five years, for sure, as we have in the last four years. I think it's worth saying that we, we made a mistake, I think, when we bought the club. We didn't have really good financial control. I, I wish we'd had the equivalent of Martin when we came in. And David kept badgering me to bring in someone like a Simon, well, eventually we brought Simon himself in. So right. uh, Simon Blake is, as I said at the annual meeting, annual general meeting, not just a, he's not an employee, he's not an investor, he's kind of independent. And he, and he says his views very clearly, but he's mm -hmm. helped us with business, business planning and financial control. So Simon, anything to add? Uh, thanks, Nigel, and um, those kind words. I just want to... Um, pretty much repeat what Kent was saying, that it's great that we've got the funding. The funding of the club is secured for the foreseeable future, and that's fantastic. But for me, the exciting addition with the new directors and the new shareholders is the level of expertise they bring. And if you had to assemble a team to help you run your business, it would, well, you probably wouldn't be able to because they wouldn't be available, but it would cost you an absolute fortune. And I don't know if people are aware, but the, the directors give of their time freely all directors all have done since uh, 2017. Um, and uh, hope, hopefully that wasn't a shock to any of you guys. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think it's just fantastic. What we've done already is fantastic, but what we will do will be even better. Thank you, Simon. Luke? Yeah, uh, just on the back of that, um, we've had one little question thrown in on YouTube, which might be a, a nice time in, um, which was if we did climb the leads, do you, do you see our medium to long-term future at Brisbane Road with its 9K capacity? Huh. That's a great question. Uh, who do you think should answer that one, Kent? <laughs> well, I mean, we can definitely give our different views. It, yeah. um, I, I look at different models around the Premier League and, you know, as we climb, we will different opportunities will come. I, I, I believe that the current situation where we are uh, would be a fantastic place to play uh, in the championship. Um, it might be a little bit small compared to other championship venues, uh, but also as we get larger and larger, there may be other opportunities. So I, you know, for me, it's a great place to be. It's a great place to play. It's a great place for us uh, to do the things that we do. But I do understand the desire to have a larger broadcast platform. So I guess from that perspective, I guess that's where I would ask Dave Travis what his perspective is on venues and all of that, being a broadcaster and knowing the advantages and disadvantages of larger venues and smaller venues and that sort of thing across the country. Thanks, Ken. Um, <clears throat> well, it's a, it's a quandary, isn't it? Because uh, you have the passion, the history, the location, and we are E10. And uh, I think that's hard to take away. You've seen clubs move. West Ham did it. Uh, Arsenal did it. I'm not too sure the atmosphere has been retained. And... Um, I think we have to think strongly about if we are to progress and go in that direction and see the demand, then we have to consider our options. Uh, I probably sit with Kent that, you know, if you could redevelop on what we have and expand the capacity and make it sustainable 
and not over invest, but potentially look at other revenue streams and, and tap into things like what you see in other clubs, hotels, who knows what, what um, there is potential, but I think it's steady goes. We had a very long, long debate about the uh, roof and whether we wanted to invest now or in the future. And uh, we, we couldn't quite find the magic answer. I think we'd all have rather invested in a, a bigger, more ambitious project. But uh, that's probably very much for the future. But, you know, first things first, we land uh, League One and then take the next step and the next step. And I think we're all big believers in we can't boil the ocean, iterative step forwards, and we will make this better and better. And hopefully we can match that on the pitch. I think it's interesting that we do value different opinions and it's probably good just to ask someone who's new and perhaps hasn't been to the ground very often. Kevin, as a kind of a new person who's on the inside but was on the outside, any thoughts on what Kent and David have said? Yeah, no, I think I think the bottom line is, you know, we, we want to have the best pitch with the best atmosphere and, and the best amenities around it as we possibly can. Um, you know, the, the U.S. is learning a lot about um, building soccer only stadiums, sorry, football only stadiums in the U.S. Um, and, and they've come up with some interesting things. I've toured around some of them. So I think you know, maybe we can learn from, uh, you know, from some things that are going on over here and apply them over there. Um, and uh, and just get the best fan experience we possibly can for our, our folks, and and you know invest smartly while we do it. So, thanks. I think we've said before that if we did move, eventually, we'd try as much as we could to do it within the Walton Forest Borough. I mean, uh, you know, we're very we have an excellent relationship with them. I think it's a two way street. I think. Uh, they realised they nearly lost the prize asset back in 2017. So we've had an excellent ongoing relationship. But I, I agree with what's been said. I think we need to focus on getting out of League Two first and foremost. Luke? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Nigel. Um, next up was um, a question from Andy. And the first part, I guess, has already been answered. But the second part is probably one that would be quite interesting to discuss. He said, uh, two very simple questions. Is Why would you want to invest in a small club in the fourth tier of English football? And what do you believe you can bring to the club that currently doesn't exist within it? So, um, we touched on the first one, as you say. So, th let's just get some different views. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? Um, you know, as far as the investment, and in, uh, I see... I see the upside here, uh, and we've talked about it throughout this call of moving up and being promoted. That's that's exciting to me. Um, and and as far as what I think I can bring to the expertise side of it, um, I've done a lot of sports partnerships with professional teams in the U.S. and Nigel and I have talked about it. And there are opportunities uh, ahead for Leighton that I'm, I'm very excited to help explore um, as part of the, you know, the success we're going to have in the future. And Nick, do you think there's any similarities between football and baseball? Uh, well, I, I think in the running of a football club and a baseball club, uh, there are. So I'll, I'll give you a very specific, uh, small example, but, uh, you know, I, I think one of the one of the prize uh, people as part that is part of the management team at Orion is Josh Stevens, who heads our commercial. And uh, I've taken my Josh Stevens uh, here in the U.S. at my baseball team and connected him with with Orient's Josh Stevens. And uh, it's amazing, even uh, just in the first couple of conversations, how there are some things that we actually do in the U.S. that aren't necessarily prevalent in terms of, for example, identifying potential corporate sponsors in terms of different ways of making a presentation. So real tangible things that at our baseball team have, have uh, helped us you know, really expand our corporate sales. And Josh is pretty excited about it. So I do think in the management side, there are a lot of things that uh, we can share from the U.S. that is that could be very helpful. 
I don't think there's a role for a shortstop in this squad yet. <laughs> you never know. Uh, you better explain what a shortstop is, but anyway. <laughs> um, we'll let one more go. Uh, Jason, have you got any thoughts on this? You know, my background is in real estate, so I think at the margin, perhaps I have some insights there, but I think um, other than my modest financial contribution, I think I just provide some sort of common sense observations, mostly, frankly, from a fan standpoint. Um, and I think there are important lessons to be learned from being a fan at different types of experiences. So as it pertains to the stadium question, I think all those answers are right on target. And I think, first off, that would be a fantastic problem to have to solve. Um, needing a much bigger stadium to accommodate our all of our promotions. So I, I really look forward to that. But, you know, I think one needs to be careful in the grass is always greener approach to new stadiums and moving up. Um, there have been a number of, you know, NFL franchises that have moved thinking that, you know, they're going to get a better deal in another city or, you know, they're going to go from San Diego to L.A. And then, oh, what do you know? The fans stop showing up. And so I think you need to be really mindful of who your core customer is and, you know, your loyalty is first to them to deliver them a superior product uh, and make sure that they're along for the ride and not that, you know, you know, if and when you get promoted to the premiership, you boom, you leave behind all your, your, your best customers and fans. So I think, um, you know, those would be the types of observations I would hope to make. Uh, but again, I, I, I don't see much risk in that from uh, folks on the phone here. Holly, anything to add? Um, not really. I think uh, um, I explained why I, I think Leighton Orient is a great uh, a, a great group to invest in, number one. And, and then the, the data analytics side is something that I'm very uh, keen on. Um, and it's something that I've used over my career in mean, every single decision I've ever made, uh, only to either support my, my my thesis or refute my thesis. And I hope that we can uh, bring some of that to, to Leighton Orient. Okay, Lou, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Nigel. Um, next question was from Darren, and he's asked, was the timing of the, of, timing of the investment and financial restructuring critical to the superb appointment of Kenny Jackett? both in terms of affordability and as a statement of intent from our new investors and board? Okay, so great question. And I think Martin answered part of this last week when he introduced Kenny. Uh, when we first had Kenny's name on our list, we didn't think we'd be able to get it. Um, and we had a list of, by the way, I want to say again what a fantastic job was done. I think there were three candidates, Martin, that you could have taken for the job. And we had the difficult job of trying to select between three really good candidates. Uh, one candidate landed at another club recently and another candidate, I think, will land probably in the next week somewhere. So we had a great choice. But we were surprised that Kenny was available and really enthusiastic to come. And we're delighted with the selection. But I think it was coincidence the two events came together. But because we, if, if there's one thing I like to think that we are, we are open and transparent. All the candidates that came through in the last stage of the process to Kent and I were given the investor deck because we wanted them to see what the investors have seen so that they knew not just about coaching and managing on the field, they also knew everything else that we were doing with the rest of the club. Because the way we run the club is everyone has the opportunity to have a say in everything. I mean, you probably don't know it, but we run employee calls every couple of weeks, including the players, and they're all encouraged to talk about anything they want. So that's a culture which, by the way, is probably unusual in football. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting that I think um, we've now got a situation where uh, we've got Kenny on board. Kenny's going to, I think, bring in an insight, a maturity of experience that we haven't had before. So even though it's a coincidence, it's a very good coincidence. 
Can I just add a couple of little bits from that, Nigel? The, the thing that, for me, when I when Kenny showed some interest at the start and I went to meet him for a coffee, I think the big thing for me is once I can get people through the door, I know I've got a good chance of getting them because the club will prove to them that what a well-run football club is. like me keep saying we are a well-run football club, we are this, we are that. But when they come through the door and they go through the process of the second phase uh, interview and then the third phase interview with, with Nigel and Kent, when they come away from it, you know, they, they, they love the club more than when they come in. So, so when Kenny's name come to me, I thought if I can get him through the door, you know, get him to... You know, obviously the coffee side of things or the first interview from me is the, a, a chance for either part, either party to pull out. You know, I might not take a liking to them. They might not like, take a liking to the club or to what my role is within the club, you know, or or anyone's role within the club, not just my role. Uh, but, yeah, once Kenny just, you know, he, he just kept growing on him. And I know if we could say, when you take him to the stadium, the stadium's impressive for a League Two club. You look at everything that's going on there in terms of your, your, you know, the work that's going on to make the, the uh, level two and level three better for things for the for the future. So uh, we got Kenny for it, it was a coincidence, uh, but it's 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 about how the club is run from from top to bottom. If we get good, if we get people in through that door. I think we'll always have a chance of holding on to it. And, you know, he, he's been massively impressed since then. As I said, I talked about a free analyst and uh, he was surprised that a club of our level had free analysts and, and, and you know, and, and talked about how we do things. And we are run, you know, everything that we do is, is professionally run to the eighth degree, everything is done perfectly. You, you know, talking about you know when do you go away? On, how many Friday night trips do you have? Simple things like that, and just saying, well, anything over three and a half hours, we go overnight. So everything is done in a, in the best possible way to make the football as successful as you can. And hence we we catch a big fish like Kenny Kenny Jacket. <clears throat> Thank you, Martin. Um, we try and fly through a few more questions as I imagine we're pretty coming up towards the end of our time. A question from um, Alan, and this will be one, one for you, Kent. Um, he asks, he's wondering wh whether Kent T cancelling of two million worth of shares generously to benefit the club um, signals any way of a lessening of his active and fervent involvement with Leighton Orient. And I know it's one we kind of touched on at the beginning, Kent, but it might be nice to, um, to, to address that one. Uh, some of us are crazy enough to invest in a fourth tier uh, English football club. And some of us are crazy enough to invest in a fifth tier <laughs> English <laughs> football club. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that from day one, uh, we said that, that my investment was primarily a gift, that if it was ever needed for it to be a gift, it would be transformed from an investment into a gift. Uh, the way that, uh, you know, in order for the financial transaction, the new investors, for it to make sense to them, um, you know, we, we did some restructuring. And my request was that when we did restructuring at the Eagle level, that that was reflected uh, on behalf of the club. As far as my role, certainly my role will change over time, just like Nigel's role has changed over time and David's role has adjusted and Matt Porter's role has adjusted. All of our roles will continue to adjust. You know, uh, we have a, a whole new group of great friends that are going to help us, all of us together, make this club a better club. And that's the reason why we're here, right? That's the reason why we're here. We're here to improve the club, to make the club better, to improve the fan experience, to improve the staff experience, to improve the player experience and the coaching staff experience 
so that it's something that we can be proud of. And I don't think there's anyone on this call who's doing it for more than a love of the game, a love of the club, and a love of Lake Orient. And it and it and it'll come. It'll come differently to different people. This love, this fan, this family, this clan. But I think for all of us, including me, I'll be just as involved as I've ever been. I promise you, I will deserve the moniker crazy as a box of frogs. I promise you, I will deserve that continued uh, going forward. So um, I'm just as excited about Leighton Orient as I was four years ago. Uh, my financial position, if you wanna talk about it that way, that changing is not going to change my commitment or my love for Leighton Orient Football Club. So you'll still be in the South Stand Bar at 1.15 when you get. <laughs> yes, probably so. <laughs> okay, look. Um, a question we had in on YouTube, I think it was a guy from John. Um, quite an interesting question. Um, to say, other than promotion, what other factors would the broader investors consider as a success? Um, Rich, do you want to have a go with that first? Yeah, it's a, it's a very thoughtful question. Um, I guess that other than promotion, having a club that supporters uh, and more supporters to be added are even more passionate about Football is football, but what I've come to recognize as an American and being indoctrinated into the football culture is it's also part of life. Uh, and if we can expand that experience for existing and a growing population of supporters, I would consider that also a success. Yeah, I... I'll add a couple, I think, obviously, making the club more sustainable, which means changing the financial mm -hmm. side. I think we also want to continue to work on fan engagement. Uh, it was interesting. I met one of the Super League owners recently, and they were kind of shocked at the response that they got when they suggested the Super League. And my answer was, well, when did you last talk to the fans? And the answer was, well, about two years ago. That won't do. So our fan engagement, which I think has been pretty good, has to be even better. And, and I think that's, that's a measurement. Um, anyone else want to comment? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's all about the foundation, isn't it? It's not just a, it's the sustainability, which I think wraps up everything, but it's having the right people at the club the right talent and that's not just on the football side it's on the marketing the commercial side which then allows us to do all the other things in a business plan that secures um the financial security around the club um it, and just building on that foundation increasing the fan engagement the amount of people who's getting involved getting our brand out overseas increasing everywhere as much as possible and tapping into all the resources and the capabilities we have is just incredible is the most important thing um you could chuck out some other things which i'm sure wasn't meant by the question but a nice cup run uh, all of those other activities building on the academy they're all super important to us to uh uh to to go on this journey and uh to answer another question earlier the benefit of being in league you know in uh, league two is um, we, hopefully we can be competitive, start winning more things. The last thing you want to be is, is uncompetitive and not have an opportunity. We, we can hopefully climb through the hierarchy and have a few bites of the cherry at different things. So that's super exciting for us. That's good. Martin, did you hear that thing about a cup run? Did you write that down? We'll have a bit of chat about that, Martin, at some point now. Eh? I think I was on mute on that bit, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing that I would mention is uh, the development of the women's side. Um, I think that that's an exciting uh, opportunity for Leighton Orient and something that 
Um, I know everybody on this this call is uh, is all for it. So to push forward on that is uh, is as a success would be really great. Well, and I think on that side, we'd encourage the fans to go and see the women's team, you know, under Martin's leadership. And and you know, one of the dreams I've got is that when I go and I recognise COVID has kind of screwed this up like it has many things. But when I go and see an academy game on a Saturday morning, instead of being like 20 fans there, why haven't we got 200? I mean, I mean, the, the quality of the football is excellent. So I think, you know, an ideal weekend if we're in London is see the academy game on Saturday morning to see our team, first team in the afternoon and then the women's team on a Sunday. I think just to add to what Carly said there about the women's, the women's is such a a blank canvas as as we are at the moment. It's you know we've we've took the you no know, we haven't for all the stuff that was talked about we haven't took away or any any women's football. We actually we're looking to enhance it. We're looking to fetch it to more people. We're looking to fetch it to the stadium and, and fetch it to the fans. So. All this uh, that was was written is is so not true. It's about uh, building it for the the women's and and to say it's a blank canvas is something that there's nothing better than trying to build something when when there's not anything there in the first place and you've got to put the foundations in and it's a similar situation to when we first walked into the football club. You know, it was it was about putting the foundations down and building from there, and the women's side of it is is very much the same. And we got. We got a head of uh, women's football coming in uh, from the first of July onwards, and it, it will only go from strength to strength. And because foot, women's football is going from strength to strength, we've not touched on it yet, but we will going forward. Okay, Luke. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, I think one question probably to, to try and wrap up on is: is Paul on YouTube's asked um, how many season tickets you've sold so far this season? Well, not this season, but for next season, should I say. Probably best for uh, Danny. Yeah, thank you, uh, Luke, for the question. Uh, we went over the 1,000 mark, I think, overnight or first thing this morning, uh, which is slightly above where we uh, thought we would be at this stage. Obviously, the mailing landed last weekend. Uh, so that's a mixture of renewals as well as uh, fans buying season card packs for the first time. We've set a target to get to 4,000. Uh, that's ambitious, uh, but I genuinely think we can be there through the loyalty that our season card holders are, are showing and also a number of fans that have missed football so much they've gone to that next level of buying a season card so seats are saved until the end of June uh, obviously that's just over a month away so the clock will soon tick and we hope that we can have more season card holders uh, than, than perhaps ever before or certainly in recent years uh, at the Brown Group Stadium because it makes such a difference it's one of the things we discussed we're joining the interview stages with, with candidates and especially Kenny about the, the difference that fans make and how strange it's been without that. And that's uh, one of the endorsements that, that Kenny certainly uh, said during the phase. Why don't you just say you've got a couple of warm up events? I think West Ham and Gillingham. Uh, uh, yeah, so West Ham and Gillingham friendlies are announced, and there will be one other uh, that we're working on behind the scenes, uh, but Martin and myself and others that we hope to be able to announce in the very, very near future, which will be a good friendly to have. Uh, and yeah, that will allow fans to get back into the stadium. We have to do test events in order to be able to get our safety certificate uh, to the right levels, which every club will have to go through, and we have to go through, especially because of the development of the uh, of the stand. So yeah, very much watch, watch this space in terms of that additional uh, 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 fixture. So just bringing this to a conclusion, um, I know some people commented about the All American. <laughs> Uh, group of investors. We did have other people from different countries. We had a Middle East group that was very enthusiastic. In fact, spent two years identifying a club to invest in, and it was Leighton Orient, so that tells you something. Uh, we had people in the UK. Coley, as many of you have read and commented online as a group, and he's got investors all over the place. Uh, so it's not just American. Um, and as someone who's who proudly is both American and uh, British, or perhaps I have to think English these days uh, after the sad events of Brexit. Um, you know, 
we will continue to work as a team. I wanted you today to see the faces of people. Um, we wanted to have the kind of engagement, though I think it's impossible to achieve, that Kent's got. So that when you see any one of these faces, you know who they are. But we're optimistic about the future. Uh, I want to thank the investors for their confidence in Leighton Orient. And thank our fans for putting up with a very difficult season. Um, I hope you enjoyed the streaming. We want to do even better the next year. And uh, I, I will conclude by wishing everyone a very happy early summer weekend. So thank you for your